you dismiss them. So he forgot, then I forgot. John chapter 20. I think I'm on back there. I'm good. Okay. Good to go. I've been so much looking forward to being with you. It's amazing how uh, the schedule uh, worked out for uh, this month. I began the month with a very dear friend of mine in Wisconsin. His name is Mike Van Zee. I guess I have preached just about every missions conference uh, for him since we first met some years ago. I'm tearing up your equipment. You know, you'd think I never use one of these things. But I've made the claim, and I say again, I think they make them all different. It's a conspiracy. Michigan and then uh, Tennessee. I was there with him just a few weeks ago, and some of you already know where I'm going with this. I uh, found out that his wife Lois is out of this church, and so I'm coming up today. And I called him and I said, you tell your wife, I get to preach in Fostoria tonight. <laughs> he said, yeah. He said, you better watch your step there. She's got family there. I said, yeah. I said, I'm a little bit concerned that they might call you and do some fact checking. <laughs> I like the way you do things around here. The preparation leading up to the conference. How you treat your guest when we arrive. Uh, the servant suite is absolutely uh, beautiful. How you feed your guest at supper time. Uh, but most of all, preacher, thank you for the honor of standing behind this pulpit. We have had this on the calendar for some years now, several years, and I've been looking forward to, to meeting your preacher, being able to enjoy his fellowship, and then, of course, be with this wonderful church that I've heard so much about. As the pastor said, I will make some effort to give a glimpse of our ministry as the days proceed. But if you could imagine tonight a country of over 1.3 billion people that's only one-third the size of the United States of America. A country that in just a few years will overtake China in population. So that very soon we will be speaking of India as being the most populated land on the face of the earth. It is a country where they say the Hindus worship more than 330 million gods. I don't know who keeps up with them all, but you can see their temples and their idols littering the landscape in all directions. And yet it's the second most populated Muslim country in the world. The only country with more Muslim than India is Indonesia. Pakistan is now number three. Yet until 1947, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh were all one country. So we literally labored in the most idolatrous land on the face of the earth, and yet the most populated Muslim region in all the world. There are more Muslim in India than in the countries of Iran, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia combined. India is a closed country, but I'm glad that God can still open the doors that men call closed. We've had the privilege for these past 23 years of laboring in this country that I think is perhaps the most incredible land on the face of the earth. Persecution is reported in every state of the country. There is no state of India without persecution. Please pray. 
Just recently, they have initiated a platform that enables uh, the common citizen to report their neighbors on the internet and ministries that are involved in evangelistic uh, endeavors. So please, please pray much for the land of India. We began laboring there those 23 years ago and found ourselves amazed at how the Lord just opened the doors one after the other, not only there, but beyond the neighboring country of Myanmar that many still remember by the name of Burma. And very soon we're going to be focusing on the land of China. I look forward to telling you about those efforts, those ministries in India, Myanmar, very soon, China. We rejoice with any church that invest in missionary efforts around the world. Whether that church budgets from the income they receive, the funds, the contributions of their people, we rejoice with that church. But we rejoice all the more in a church like your church that has a part in faith promise giving. Because God transforms a church that is involved in such a manner of giving towards missions. He transforms homes and individuals. I have no doubt, even in this church congregation, if opportunity be given, one person after the other could stand and give testimony of what the Lord has done and done through them during these past years. Each night I plan to say a comment or two about faith promise giving, but this I say at the first. Faith promise giving, it transforms a church. And I have no doubt that as a church, you could give that testimony. You've seen it happen in your lives and in your home. With our Bibles open to the book of John chapter 20, would you stand together with me please? John chapter 20, standing together shall we. I'll begin reading in verse number 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again. From the dead. I believe these are some of the most incredible words to be found in all of Scripture. The Bible says, For as yet they knew not the Scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for the privilege that is ours. to be able to gather together this evening, praying that you might give us a fresh glimpse of the vision that you would have us to see. That, Lord, you'd cause our hearts to beat in tune with your own heart. Please, Lord, 
work among us that you might work through us. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you and you may be seated. On this first day of the week, they come to the sepulchre with the intent of visiting the resting place of the dead. But he wasn't there. The tomb was empty. Yet they were not prepared for what they saw. Or should I say, they weren't prepared for what they didn't see. But why the consternation? Why should there be any question in the mind? The Bible says, for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. I look back to the pages of the Old Testament and I remind you that the resurrection had been so clearly proclaimed, prophesied in the Old Testament. Remember the words of the psalmist who said, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Job lifted his voice amidst that valley as shadows gathered about him. He said, I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. The resurrection had been so clearly proclaimed so colorfully pictured when the Lord would show who he had chosen as priest, as group of priests, the spiritual leaders to stand between his people and himself. Each tribe was to bring a, a branch. That branch that blossomed showed the Lord's pleasure as to who was his choice. You understand that that branch was literally a branch that had been severed from a tree, severed from its life that erupted with the fruit of spring. What a colorful picture of the resurrection. But I listened to the words of my Savior, who told his disciples again and again in Mark chapter 8 and verse 31. Chapter 9 and verse 31. Mark chapter 10 and verse 33. Again and again he told them that not only would he be delivered into the hands of cruel barbaric men. That he would die. But three days later he would leave behind an empty tomb. He said in chapter 14 and verse 28. He said after I am risen I'll go before thee into Galilee, and yet they come to the empty tomb. And there's only bewilderment. Why? The Bible says, for as yet they knew not the scriptures that he must rise again from the dead. I submit to you, if they would have only known the scriptures, things would have been different. If they would have only known the scriptures, the story would have unfolded in a different manner if they would have only known the scriptures. I further dare to say to you, if we only knew the scriptures, things would be a lot different in our lives and in our churches if we only knew the scriptures. You say, oh, preacher, you should remind yourself of whom you were addressing. There are Sunday school teachers that are present, deacons that have served for 
many years, perhaps, soul winners, the most faithful of the faithful here at the church for this midst of the week launching the missions conference, remind yourself who you were addressing. You say, I learned the scriptures on my mother's knee from childhood. You say, preacher, ask me of those difficult things that men often ponder in the word of God. I'm ready. I'm up to the challenge. But my friend, I say this to you. As much as we think we know, if our hearts ever find out half of what we claim, we'd have revival then. If our hearts ever found out half of what we claim to know, we'd walk out of these doors at different people then. May I say to you first, that if they would have only known the Scriptures, they would have known Christ better if they would have only known the Scriptures. When Jesus looked upon the worst of sinners, receiving them into His presence and dismissing them with forgiveness, they knew Him to be the lover of souls. Whenever he touched the blind that they might see, healed the lame that they might walk, they knew him to be the great physician. When on stormy seas he stood at the bow of a ship and spoke with such sovereign authority, that the winds they hushed their angry voice and the waves they laid themselves down to rest on distant shores, they knew him to be the sovereign Lord. But they did not know. Though when he died on the cross, they knew him to be the dying lamb. They did not know him to be the one who would conquer death, hell, and the grave. For as yet, they knew not the scriptures that he must rise again from the dead. I listened to Philip, who on that occasion, he asked of the Lord, he said, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And Jesus said in reply, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me? How often times have we confessed ourselves to be among that number who do not know him nearly as well as we ought. Oft times not nearly as well as we claim. Jesus said, search the scriptures for in them you think that you have eternal life and they are they which speak of me. The hymn writer wrote, the volume of my Father's grace does all my griefs assuage. Here I behold my Savior's face almost on every page. Another wrote, Divine Instructor, Gracious Lord, be thou forever near. Teach me to love thy precious word and view my Savior there. H.A. Ironside. Many years ago he met a godly man from Ireland who was recuperating from terrible sickness. He met him in the state of California. That elderly saint from across the seas stirred Ironside's heart so, for he'd take his tattered Bible and, and pull the truths from the pages with such power and in such wondrous fashion. Ironside asked him, he said, sir, he said, how is it that the Bible is so real to you? The man said with a smile, he said, in a sod cottage back in the home country, on a mud floor, I would kneel, placing the Bible before me, and I would cry out and say, Lord, reveal Christ to my soul. 
My friend, we need to learn to study our Bibles like that again. If they would have only known the Scriptures, they would have known Christ better. A saint was spending her last moments in this lifetime uttering with fading breath those words that had been so precious to her. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. As the moments passed on and her strength began to wane, the words, they seemed to slip from memory until at last it was only a, a phrase that lingered still. She said, that which I've committed unto him near the end, but a single word escaped her breath. She just... If you claim to be righteous, they would have known Christ better and they would have grieved less if they would have only known the Scriptures. It was a sorrowful moment when the Roman soldiers came into the garden, Judas leading them on. But oh, what unspeakable grief followed as the Bible describes literally a throng of people flowing through the streets weeping as they went the scriptures tell us that when Mary came to the tomb she herself broke down and, and wept when she took word to the disciples Mark describes them as literally Weeping, mourning, with a broken heart, crying out. But if they would have only known the Scriptures, one of them might have said, Weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. If they would have only known the Scriptures. How often times I have stepped to the pulpit during a funeral, Open the scriptures, trusting that the Lord might use me to be of some comfort to grieving souls. On more than one occasion, looking out to the audience and seeing the faces of my own family looking back to me in and, and grief and, and broken heart. And I confess to you that there have been times when I've gotten alone with the Lord myself. No audience gathering. Only myself crying out to the Lord and saying, at other times, it's been for someone else, but now, Lord, it's for me. How oftentimes we grieve as much as we do because we don't know the Scriptures as we ought. If they would have only known the Scriptures, they'd have known Christ better. They would have grieved less, and they would have rejoiced greatly if they would have only known the Scriptures. When the Roman soldiers took hold of Jesus, if they would have only known the Scriptures, Peter might have said, boy, they're in for a surprise. If they would have only known the Scriptures. When Jesus died in, in those final moments, He cried out and said, It is finished! If they would have only known the Scriptures, there might have been those who would have answered back, Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It is finished. If they would have only known the Scriptures, I believe, if they'd have only known the Scriptures during those three days that Jesus lay there in the grave, His body held within the... During those three days... I think that they'd have gathered together and they'd have practiced day after day after day so that on resurrection morning they could have sung the first Easter cantata if they would have only known the Scriptures. They would have rejoiced greatly. I think maybe one of them might have stood there beside the tomb with his Timex sundial, the one equipped for the nighttime hours, 
And he would have said to the others, in just a few moments, he's coming out of there. If they would have only known the scriptures. It is said that the Wright brothers, when they flew, they sent word back home describing their achievement. They said, we did it, we flew. We'll be home for Christmas. It was the closing words of the telegram. Well, there was a great deal of excitement in the home to find out that Wilbur was going to make it back to carve the Christmas turkey. The rest of the story has been somewhat challenged. I'd like to find out that it happened just as I heard. That when message reached the newspaper, the message sent by telegram, we flew, we'll be home for Christmas. The headline said, local bicycle merchants to be home for Christmas. And I think to myself, Somebody missed something. Well, oftentimes I find myself stepping to a pulpit week after week and looking out across an audience of those who claim to know the Scripture and thinking to myself, somebody missed something. My friend, if they'd have only known the Scriptures, they would have rejoiced greatly. A gentleman attended a little country church but he wanted to hear what all this was about, all this hoopla at the big city church, all the polish and the... So he thought he would attend. It was rather stiff. But every now and then, the preacher said something that just pulled at his heartstrings. He couldn't help it. It just happened. He said, Amen. Well, you could tell that didn't happen very often in that place. The stares of the people from all directions just made him cringe. So he thought he had quietened down just a bit. But then it happened again. This time it wasn't a mere amen. It was a hallelujah. And boy, did that do it. There's a number of men who came to him, identified themselves as being the ushers, and escorted him out. They said, you wait in the preacher's office and he'll deal with you when he's finished. You can read this magazine until he comes. Well, pretty soon they heard the man saying, Amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah. They come into the office, they look at him and they said, are you some kind of a nut? He said, no, he said, the article I was just re reading it, it, in this National Geographic, you, you gave me, it's on ocean, oceanography. So... Well, they say that a man's been exploring uh, the deepest depths of the ocean and they think that there are much deeper depths still to be found. And they said, so? He said, that's where the Bible says that God put my sins in the depths of the sea and man still hasn't found the bottom yet. Amen. Now that story might be somewhat dated, but I still rejoice in knowing that man is more acquainted with the surface of the moon than he is with the depths of the ocean. Amen. They would have rejoiced greatly. I was one of those bus kids. One of those bus kids running all over the church, you know, and now God's letting me run all over the world. I remember before I went to Bible college, before I had my two years of Greek and my, my studies in, in Hebrew, I, I remember as a child, not yet 12 years of age, sitting there in the pew watching that film that so graphically described, depicted the sorrows of hell, that film that itself is called The Burning Hell. I'll never forget when I saw that film for the first time. I sat there and I wept and my dad helped me out of the auditorium and he said, son, he said, I thought you knew you were saved. I said, dad, I do know that I'm saved. I am sure. He said, what's wrong? I'll tell you what happened, my friend. It didn't take a Bible college education for me to realize that hell was what I deserved and heaven was what I was getting. And the floodgates of my heart 
flew wide. There are some who shout. There are some who weep. There are others that you can just see it in the twinkle of their eye a great distance away. But I'll tell you this. If your heart ever finds out half of what your head claims to know, I have enjoyed on numerous occasions uh, going to the Sight and Sound Theater in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, They tell us, Fellas from South Carolina, that's Lancaster, not Lancaster. It's Lancaster. I've seen one presentation after the other. They so professionally and so skillfully, uh, live theater, animals and, and costumes and the singing, the music, amazing. My favorite presentation was Ruth. But let me tell you about my favorite moment. It didn't happen during Ruth. It happened during the presentation of Joseph. Joseph is having his dream, and he begins to ascend from the platform, levitating in the air. My wife and I were sitting in the balcony about midway, wonderful seat, looking towards the platform. Joseph ascends He comes across the audience high in the air every now and then. When he gets close to the light, you can see the safety cords that are attached to him. But there was a little fella behind us that suddenly lost it. Now, I'm going to tell you, with all their professionalism, you can't rehearse this. He lost it. And when Joseph, levitating in the air, approached us where we were sitting in the balcony, the little fellow behind us, he loses it and he says, He's flying! I tell you, he's flying! Well, I don't expect you to lose it. But I will say to you, there are some things you can't rehearse. My friend, in that moment when your heart at last finds out what your head claims to know, the story will proceed differently after that. They would have known Christ better. They would have grieved less. They would have rejoiced greatly. They would have doubted nothing. Mary comes to the tomb and He's not there. If he's not there, there's only one conclusion. Somebody stole his body. When she goes back to the tomb, she's greeted by someone for the moment she thinks is the gardener. She begins to suspect him, not knowing it's Jesus. But she looks at him and says, if you're the one who took him, she rationalized and said, a thief took his body. When she went to the disciples, she found them smitten with emotion. Later, Thomas, Thomas who wasn't present when the Lord at the first presented himself to his disciples, manifest himself to them. Thomas said, unless I see the nail prints in his hand and I can put my hand in his side, I can't believe, I want. out but Peter said I'm going fishing if they'd have only known the scriptures he no doubt would have said 
I'm going soul winning. If he'd only known the scriptures, my friend, I believe that instead of in that moment hearing the Lord's voice crying from the shore, casting his naked body into the waves and creeping into the, into the shadows. If he had only known the scriptures, I believe, he'd have been able to say, during those three days that you were away, we were holding crusade meetings around town. We even held a missions conference. Because we decided all oh, the world's got to hear what just happened. If they would have only known the scriptures, they would have done more. Jesus gave the great commission. In the book of Matthew, we read those words. Go ye therefore and, and teach all nations and Mark, we read the challenge given, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In Luke, he said, you're witnesses of these things, but the expression of the great commission in John is found in the very chapter before us. For in verse 21, he said, as my Father hath sent me, even so, Send I you. If they would have only known the scriptures long before that moment that transpired on the Mount of Olives when Jesus was to ascend back into heaven, long before that moment when he spoke with his lips the great commission, with his parting words, I believe, my friend they would have already been making plans to go if they would have only known the Scriptures. Is it not a surprising moment for so many Christians when they discover that some of their most favorite Bible stories are missionary stories? Joseph being sold by his brothers into Egypt. And when that day came that God sent deliverance to the hand of Moses, a mixed multitude went forth with the Jewish people. Daniel, there in Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because of their faithfulness, a king gave a decree that all men in the empire to worship what they were to worship, one true and the living God. And Daniel would leave scripture in that place that would later encourage the wise men to go forth to that place where the newborn Savior lay in a manger. A wolf, Christians would find it. Bible stories are in fact missionary stories. Even looking to the book of Acts and seeing that it's a record of the missionary exploits of the early church. Proceeding on to the book of Revelation and hearing those multitudes from, from every tribe and tongue lifting their voice and saying, worthy is the Lamb. And soon we find ourselves looking at this book and saying, it's all a missionary story. If we only knew the scriptures, if our hearts ever find out half of what our heads claim to know, how can we spend much time in the word of God before our hearts beat in tune with his heart? Thomas said, unless I see those nail prints, unless I thrust my hand in his side. And there came that next occasion when the Lord appeared to the disciples, Thomas now being present. Jesus gives invitation for, for Thomas to, to look at his body and examine the scars. And instead, Thomas falls on his face in his presence and says, My Lord and my God. 
when your heart finds out half of even what your head claims, so even but half, my friend, you'll never be the same after that. Thomas, history tells us, went to India as a missionary. He died there as a martyr. Oftentimes, those of India have told me they've sent the message you preach. It's an English gospel. It's an American gospel. And I smile and say in reply, no. This story was preached in your country before my country as a nation ever existed. Because my friend, something happened in his heart. And he could never be the same after that moment. Some of the most incredible words that I find in scripture. The Bible says, for as yet they knew not the scriptures that he must rise again from the dead. And I say to you, if they would have only known, things would have been different. And I say to you, if our hearts ever find out half of what our heads claim to know, we'll never be the same. Would you dare to begin this missions conference by simply praying and saying, Dear Lord, teach this heart of mine what my head claims to know. Dear Lord, let my heart beat in tune with your own heart.